All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a couple more people. I hear We hear the elevators chiming out there, so we'll have a few more people rolling in, and of course, for our online audience as well. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our briefing. Uh, this is the second briefing in our five-part series, Farm Bill in Focus, and I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And today, our look at the Farm Bill continues with climate, energy, and economic win-wins in the Farm Bill. And I'd like to say a special thanks to Senate Agriculture Committee, Committee Chair Debbie Stabenow for helping us with the room today and, and for being our, co our, being our host up here. Um, and in fact, it's really nice that we're in this room today because in a couple months, we'll be back up here on the Hill uh, with the Senate uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, which is co-chaired by Senator Jack Reed and Senator Mike Crapo for the 2023 Congressional Clean Energy Expo, which we're really, really excited about. So if you like this room, if you like what you see today, definitely keep an eye out for that. It'll be posted pretty soon. Uh, EESI was founded in... 1984, um, on a bipartisan basis, by members of Congress to provide policymaker educational resources. Uh, and today, what that means is we do a lot of briefings, uh, briefings like today. Uh, we also started the year with our Congressional Climate Camp series. Uh, we looked at four big topics, budget and appropriations, public polling and public attitudes about climate change, non-CO2 emissions uh, and other pollutants, and the status of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and Inflation, Re and Inflation Reduction Act uh, implementation. Um, since then, we've also done briefings about the energy efficiency and renewable energy programs underway at DOE, the nuclear energy programs underway at DOE. We've got one coming up on June 1st uh, on hydrogen with Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, and a couple weeks ago, uh, our good friends at NRDC worked with us uh, to do a really great briefing about organics agriculture. And I'd like to definitely plug that as well. All of our briefings, all of our fact sheets, all of our resources, uh, everything is available always online at www.eesi.org. And the best way to keep up with what we do is to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. So uh, I went through briefings, but what we really try to do is make all of our resources uh, timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. And the reason why we do that is because we know what it's like to be a congressional staff person. And so we have a number of you in the room today. We have a number of you in our online audience. And we know what happens when your boss walks into your, your cube or your office and says, I need to know about something. Well, if it wants to know or she wants to know about a climate change topic, that's what EESI is for. We want to be your go-to resource for nonpartisan, science-based information information about all manner of climate change topics. Um, we also uh, are paying special attention, as evidenced today, to the Farm Bill. And so while the Farm Bill uh, is not specifically a climate bill, there are a lot of uh, provisions and programs that will be up for debate in the context of the Farm Bill, including many of the win-wins we talk about today that will have climate impacts, whether on the adaptation side or the mitigation side. And we're putting a lot of thought into our resources of special call, uh, special call out uh, to our legislative side by side by sides. What is that? Well, these are just comparisons with existing law of existing law with the House and Senate text when we get it. And again, everything is available online, trying to make the congressional staff person's job um, as easy as possible. Um, you can definitely help us out with that, or definitely count us count on us for that. And everything's available online at www.eesi.org forward slash 2023 Farm Bill. And there's a number of my colleagues that are here today. Most of us, Allison, looking at you, I don't see one on you, but most of us are wearing our EESI lapel pins. And so if you have questions or you want to learn more about what we do, just track us down. We'll be, hang we'll be hanging out uh, after the briefing today, and we'd love to catch up and say hi and chit chat. Oops, I see, I said I wasn't going to use the clicker, and I didn't. But these are pictures of all of our great resources. That's our hearing tracker. If you are not keeping up with every agriculture committee hearing, or if you weren't here in the 117th Congress, but you're interested in what the House and Senate committees did, we have a hearing tracker that tracks all of the climate change uh, topics that popped up in those hearings, and they're really, really good. That's our side by side. Um, we also have more briefings coming up. We did one two weeks ago on the process. It was a great briefing. We had uh, uh, really tremendous experts helping us understand not just the farm bill process, but also how you can engage in the farm bill process on behalf of your boss if you're new to the farm bill. Uh, it was really, really great. Two weeks to, from today, we'll be back uh, with our host, uh, Representative Jim Clyburn, and we'll be talking about uh, unlocking rural economies, farm bill investments in rural America. Two weeks after that, for future of forestry in the farm bill, and then two weeks after that, conservation practices from farms to forests to, and wetlands. So a lot of really great briefings coming up, and I hope everyone uh, takes advantage of them. And even if you can't make it in person, that's okay. 
If you RSVP, that ensures that you get a, a link to the live cast, it ensures you get the presentation materials, and a couple weeks after the briefing, it ensures that you get the written summary notes, which are really, really handy. But about our briefing today, uh, agriculture accounts for about 11% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Farms, ranches, and forests are increasingly and more frequently negatively affected by climate-related impacts like drought, flooding, and extreme heat. And our panelists today will help explain how Farm Bill policies and programs help agricultural producers and communities reduce greenhouse gas emissions, build climate resilience, and promote economic development and create jobs. We are going to cover really interesting topics today, diverse topics today, and if you have uh, questions, there are a couple ways you can ask those questions. For everyone in the room, we'll have a roving mic, and so when it comes time for Q&A, uh, we'll go around the room with the mic, raise your hand, catch my eye, and you can ask your question. If you're in our online audience today, you can follow us on social media, at EESI online, hashtag EESI talk. You can also send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org, and you can ask your questions that way, and we'll do our best to incorporate them uh, into the discussion. But that brings us to our first panelist today, Micah McMillan. Micah is a senior analyst in the Natural Resources and Environment Team of the Government Accountability Office, where he's worked since 2004. Micah's work is primarily focused on climate change, water infrastructure, and the impacts of energy production on water quality. In recent years, Micah has written reports on climate resilience in drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, the migration of communities due to the impacts of climate change, and climate resilience in agriculture. Micah, thanks for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. And Here's your clicker. I hope it works better for you than it did for me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate today. We really appreciate it. Um, I just want to start this off by saying that our climate change work primarily focuses on, in particular our work on climate change and agric agricultural, focuses on climate resilience and not greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And in particular, we're emphasizing improving climate resilience to reduce the fiscal exposure of the federal government. Um, so at the start, no, oh, sorry, okay, there we go. Um, at the start of each new session of Congress, uh, we issue what's called the high risk list, and it basically identifies programs and operations that are high risk due to vulnerabilities uh, to fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, or that need transformation. Um, Federal fiscal exposure and climate change was added to the list in 2013. And uh, we've categorized those risks into five different risks, including uh, including uh, fiscal risk due to, uh, to the federal government as an insurer of property and crops. And we just issued our most recent uh, high risk list report in April of this year. Um, our past recommendations primarily focus in two different areas. It's mainstreaming, which is sort of the idea of integrating climate resilience into existing programs and operations. And, uh, and then in cases where policy issues or projects with large and complex scopes that cut across agency missions and programs, uh, we make re recommendations generally to create new institutions. And in many cases, these are kind of the large projects that are the biggest fiscal risks to the federal government. Um, in 2020, we published the Disaster Resilience Framework, uh, which identified key principles and a series of questions to help federal decision making on actions to improve resilience to disasters and climate change, and also to evaluate existing efforts to improve resilience. Um, the framework identifies three key principles, accessing information uh, that can be used to identify risks and risk reduction strategies integrating analysis and planning across agencies and programs to take coordinated resilience actions, and creating incentives to make long-term forward-looking risk reduction investments, um, and to make them more viable and attractive among com competing priorities. Okay, so earlier this year, we, uh, published, we published a report um, that basically summarizes actions USDA has taken to help producers enhance their resilience and strengths and limitations uh, of policy options available to USDA to help producers enhance their resilience. Um, and just to sort of illustrate the importance of this issue from a fiscal perspective, um, in 2021, 
The uh, crop insurance program insured over 100 agricultural commodities uh, with a total liability of around 136.6 billion and uh, premium subsidies totaling about 8.6 billion. And then also uh, between 2018 and 2021 alone, or at least disasters that occurred in 2018 to 2021, uh, we appropriated more than 15 billion in agricultural disaster relief and assistance. Um, so I just wanna, before we get into the report, I just wanna say that the report was designed to provide a comprehensive and diverse set of perspectives on strengths and limitations of the options that we identified um, just to inform congressional decision making. Um, and it's, it's not policy prescriptive uh, beyond that. Okay, so as far as actions that USDA has taken, they've probably been done through the climate hubs. Uh, starting around 2015, they did a series of regional vulnerability assessments, kind of looking at region-specific vulnerabilities to agriculture and also some high-level uh, actions that uh, producers could take to enhance their resilience. Um, they've also developed, developed some region-specific tools and uh, tools and guidance uh, to help producers uh, take action on their own. Um, in response to a series of executive orders by the Biden administration, USDA has developed some department-wide uh, climate resilience planning starting in, about in 2021, and they followed that up with uh, an update in 2022. Uh, they've also developed uh, a series of uh, sub-agency uh, planning documents that sort of fit into the larger uh, department-wide plan. Technical and uh, financial assistance provided through USDA's conservation programs can provide some indirect incentives to producers to enhance their resilience. Um, and also some of the climate change provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, depending on how it's implemented, could potentially uh, create some in indirect incentives uh, to help producers enhance their resilience. Okay, so this is the list of options that we identified. I, th this is, you know, we have almost 30 to 40 pages of discussion on these options and their strengths and limitations. I can't really get into it in, the, in this context, but. Um, I'd like to refer you to the report if you're interested in, in sort of going through these. It's a pretty comprehensive set of limitations that we've, and uh, strengths that we've summarized, and it kind of helps illustrate the trade-offs that, you know, are going to have to occur for us to take action on some of these. All right. Um, so kind of summarizing the high-level findings. Uh, experts told us that implementing multiple options have the most potential to improve producer resilience uh, because they can leverage the strengths and limitations. Um, they can address the strengths and leverage the, the I'm sorry, <laughs> address the limitations and leverage some of the strengths of, of the uh, various options. And the timing and the sequence is important. Um, for example, for something like regional climate resilient, resilience planning, that could be an opportunity to, to generate buy-in among the producers and some of the key stakeholders. And also it could be an opportunity to sort of set priorities um, for when the, when the options should be implemented and, if they, and how, it, how it should be done sequentially. Um, USD is kind of unsure as to what the statutory authority that they're gonna need to implement some of these options. And also um, they're not really they don't really know what resources they were gonna need. So we sort of, we found that a comprehensive analysis of the options would help identify the planning priorities and help inform congressional decision making. So we recommended that USDA should analyze options to enhance the climate resilience of agricultural producers and integrate them into USDA's future climate resilience prioritization and planning efforts. And uh, the analysis should include um, USDA's decisions to prioritize or not prioritize which options and identify any authority and resources that USDA might need for implementation. Um, and USDA agreed with the recommendation. So, all right, thank you. And Micah, the best place to get that report is to visit gao.gov. Yeah, it's also included it on the uh, stuff that we have.
stuff on your website. Excellent. And that was, what was the segue I was hoping for. Uh, in addition to the presentation materials, our panelists have also made, some of our panelists have also made recommendations of other resources. So if you go to our briefing page, it is a really convenient way to kind of download everything. Um, and, um, and that includes the slides that Micah and our other panelists will present. Um, also, um, if you're thinking of questions that you would like to Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you were waving at me, Troy, sorry. I thought I was getting a big wave, um, just a big stretch. Um, if you have questions in the audience, we'll have a roving microphone. My good friend Isabella uh, will help us with that when it comes time for Q&A. Uh, if you are in our online audience, you can follow us on social media, at EESI online, hashtag EESI talk. You can also send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, uh, that's ASK at EESI.org. That brings us to Audrey Epps-Schmidt. Audrey is the North America Agroforestry Program Manager at the Nature Conservancy. Audrey manages a $60 million USDA Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities grant designed to advance agroforestry as a regenerative agriculture solution in the United States. Audrey has been working at the nexus of regenerative agriculture and environmental conservation for over 10 years, and we're really happy to have you today to learn about uh, uh, agroforestry. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. And can you guys hear me all right? Okay, wonderful. Well, I first wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here today to talk with you all. Um, let me just pass through here. So again, I'm Audrey Epschmidt. I'm the North America Agroforestry Program Manager at the Nature Conservancy. Just first, a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. At TNC, our vision is a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our needs and enrich our lives. TNC has been working for decades with farmers, ranchers, um, forest landowners in order to understand what are the conservation opportunities that exist that can help for rural development and creating safer communities. And you know, right now we're in a moment where the agriculture sector is contributing, it's estimated about 24% of emissions here in the US, What's the opportunity for us to help farmers bottom line while helping them be part of the climate solution? And one of those opportunities that is underutilized is agroforestry. So agroforestry is the strategic integration of trees into cropping systems, whether they're grazing systems or kind of your more traditional annual cropping systems. And I want to note agroforestry has been around for millennia. They, this is, these are practices that have been used by communities across the globe, importantly uh, indigenous communities as well. And where we're at today is re-envisioning what could agroforestry look like in our modern landscapes with our modern industrialized agriculture. What's the role of integrating more trees into our farms so that there's profit and all the environmental benefits we know come from that? And um, you know, I'd like to note the USDA has been involved in promoting agroforestry, goes back to the 98 Farm Bill, which helped found the National Agroforestry Center, a really important resource that's really helped us move the needle to date on integrating more agroforestry into um, our farmlands. And USDA recognizes five specific agroforestry practices. Just to run through them quickly, there's alley cropping, and that's putting tree crops, maybe fruit, nuts, timber, biodiversity species, in row with existing annual crops. Next is windbreaks. That's where you're more strategically placing the trees to reduce wind pressure that might be negatively impacting your crops. Silvopasture, really critical and underutilized in our grazing systems. These are trees that are there to benefit herd health. So it can be really beneficial for individual animal health as well as weight gain in extreme cold temperatures and extreme heat temperatures, which we all know is modeled to be more and more the reality for us. And uh, next, riparian buffers. Riparian buffers are adding forested areas right alongside whatever the waterway is. And this, this is known to have really strong water quality benefits, specifically you know, the concerns that exist around increased nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from our farmlands. And last, the final one is forest farming. And forest farming is when you take an existing forested landscape and you introduce botanicals like ginseng or blue cohosh to add a new layer, a new revenue stream for that forest landowner um, to have an additional crop coming out of that. And 
you know, the truth is, this is an underutilized resource that we have. We know that this is a tool that can be added, and what I'm here today to talk about is how this is an economic win-win. This is, there are a myriad of co-benefits here, and specifically the stories that can come from agroforestry by being a climate solution, coupling that with farmers' bottom lines, rural development, job creation, it's just a real good win-win, and um, it can really help farm individual farmers' resilience as well. We know there's increased market volatility that happens, there's extreme weather events. By having farmers add a new cropping system to their land, that's an additional revenue source that brings them more economic resiliency in times of difficulty. And um, from an agroecological perspective, of course, this is really important for introducing additional habitat for pollinators. Um, so that biodiversity question, it really helps on the biodiversity side of things. Um, not to mention, again, water quality and um, food resilience as well. But there are a lot of barriers for why agroforestry isn't more widespread yet in the United States. Right now, it's estimated that only approximately 2%, a little under 2% of U.S. farmland uses any kind of agroforestry practice. Under 2%. That seems like a missing opportunity for us. And so um, there's, you know, there's technical challenges, there's social challenges, and there's financial challenges for why this isn't yet the reality. One of those financial challenges is that these are pretty expensive upfront costs to put in really high quality agroforestry systems. And it can sometimes take five, eight plus years before you see the returns from these systems. If we know that this is a climate solution that can help our farmers, how can we help them? How can we help get them the incentives to make this leap to do this longitudinal shift on their operation? And so we're extremely grateful that um, USDA awarded us a $60 million um, award from the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodity Grant. Uh, we have over five years, we'll be working with a myriad of different partners, some of whom are listed on this map here across 29 different states. The biggest chunk from that 60 million is 36 million, so about 60% is specifically direct to um, farmer incentive payments to get more agroforestry plantings in the ground over the next five years. And to do that, we're offering regionalized technical assistance and farmer outreach to help them think through what type of agroforestry might make sense in their particular context. And really specifically addressing the needs of underser historically underserved producers is a really key part of our outreach efforts as well. And ultimately, all of this is to create a national network of demonstration sites. We need more proof points in more geographies. We all know farmers want to talk to other farmers and hear the good, the bad, and the ugly of what does or doesn't work. They want to be on a farm, kick the tires, see the system themselves. And so our theory is by getting these demonstration sites in more places across the country, we will have network effects seeing that happen more and more. And Finally, we know we have to work with retailers and national food brands to make sure that there is market demand and grow new markets for some of these crops. So just for a second, envision with me. This is an Illinois cornfield, but guess what? There's trees in it, and how beautiful is that? They're protected. The, the little you know, white straws are the tree protectors to, from the deer pressure, but this probably doesn't look that normal today. This is unusual to see trees growing in our commodity row crop fields. Again, today it's less than 2% of U.S. farmland. Envision with me, what if in five years' time we more than double that to just 5% of U.S. farmland? What if in 50 years this was the norm and it looked weird to have a field that didn't have trees in it? There's a real opportunity to move the needle here and get more trees onto farmland and to grow them side by side with some of our commodity crops like corn, soy, wheat, et cetera. And the Farm Bill really offers a, a strong opportunity to help with this. And so having a robust Farm Bill can particularly help with supporting um, historically underserved producers and could be significant investment to help with those upfront costs and other barriers that currently exist for why 
uh, farmers are not yet adopting agroforestry at the scale we would like to see. The Farm Bill offers an opportunity to de-risk some of those barriers that today exist. So finally, I just want to thank you all. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity today to talk with you all about agroforestry. My contact information is there. Obviously, you can tell I love talking about agroforestry, so would love to continue the conversation and you know, better understand how can we all work together to accelerate this natural climate solution that's a win-win for nature as well as farmers. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, I wanted to um, mention on the slide that you had, Silva Pastor and a few others, um, we talked I, when I was saying like what our resources look like. We also do a lot of writing. We do briefings, but we do a lot of writing and articles and things. And we have uh, articles on a lot of those topics that Audrey presented on. So if you want to learn a little bit more, of course, you can visit uh, the Nature Conservancy and talk to Audrey after the briefing. But you can also come to our website uh, and uh, access those articles as well. Um, I would also like to mention uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, a, a little bit more than a year ago, once again with our friends at NRDC, we did a briefing on regenerative agriculture, and it was really, really excellent. Um, and all of our briefings, including that one, are available online. You can go back and watch the live cast. You can view the presentation materials, uh, and you can also um, uh, read the summary notes. Our third presenter today is Moy Mendez. Moy is a pastor and executive director of the Hope Center, a nonprofit focused on community economic development. He administers three community programs that enrich the Blue Island community in Chicago with job readiness skills in technology, auto mechanics, and agriculture. Moy is expanding community garden efforts throughout Chicago via churches that desire to address food injustices in low to moderate income communities. Moy also serves on the advisory board for Por La Creación, a faith-based alliance that educates and empowers stewards of God's creation to leave a legacy for the future by conserving our natural environment. Uh, Moy, thanks for coming all the way out to Washington uh, for our briefing today. Really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. This is a great opportunity to share with you all what's happening in the Chicagoland area. I'd love, I'd love to provide a little bit of context about the Hope Center, why we started, who we are. And the Hope Center is a nonprofit focused on community economic development. I had the privilege of growing up in Blue Island. Blue Island is a low to moderate income community and uh, filled with a lot of the existential realities that mo most low to moderate income communities are faced with. Uh, moved out, but the community never left my heart. I've had the privilege to go back and to uh, be part of the change that I would like to see in the community. And part of it was to envision a different future, a different a future that uh, sort of helps address the realities. Uh, common uh, average income for, for Blue Island is, is anywhere from $18,000 to $28,000 a year. And that's for, for both Blue Island and Robbins. Uh, Robbins is the adjacent neighboring city to Blue Island. Uh, food injustice is, is a Concern. Uh, they're both uh, food deserts, and they both have um, unemployment averages that, that are uh, more than double the national average. So this is our team. I, I thought of a vision to put together a team, and the team consists of a lot of, uh, a lot of team members who, who have specialties in different areas. Uh, I wanted to exist to add value in three of the following, in four of the following areas. Uh, social value, I wanted to add economic value, intellectual value, and spiritual value. And I wanted to do that through three of our vehicles. Auto mechanics, technology, 3D printing, computer-aided drafting, and gardening. Why gardening? Well, I just so happen to be a pastor, and uh, scripture uh, helps me understand that. God meant man and woman in, in the garden, and that's where they learned a little bit more about life in general. That's where I wanted to start. So this is the Hope Garage, uh, anywhere from women workshops, you'll see that, to uh, some of the students that start with basic auto mechanics and go-karts and work their way up to learning what a lot of the master technicians that grew up in a community um, uh, do for a living. This is the Hope Technology Department, and this is our Hope Garden. Now, our Hope Garden, this was an initially the plot of land that we had. And what everybody saw is just a barren piece of land. This is what we saw. A garden that fo focuses on not only organic gardening, but also mental wellness. So as you see to the left-hand side, there's a, a trail. And that trail is meant to help the community. It was birthed during the time of the pandemic where we understood that it was only food insecurities that we wanted to address, but also mental wellness. So we added... Uh, uh, 
a path, and in that path there's QR codes so that community could come out, check out, uh, look up one of the QR codes, have a guided tour, and after that guided tour, the community is invited to eat some of the fresh produce from, the, from our garden uh, while they relax. The monarch butterfly is very near and dear to me because my uh, father immigrated from Michoacan, Mexico, where all the monarch butterfly uh, come from. Uh, so this is where we do the majority of our educational purpose. Understand that the garden is just it's, it's similar to our community in the fact that it's a, it's, it's a small economy. Uh, it helps pollinate each other, and those are some of the practices that we help uh, educate our community with. This is our trail that's focused on mental wellness. It's a beautiful trail. It's always 15 degrees cooler than what it is in the garden because it's covered with a lot of the greenery. And this is where all the magic starts. Uh, everything that we plant in both the indoor garden and outdoor garden starts in our um, in, in-house, in, indoor greenhouse, um, where we do everything from seedling to canning to freeze drying to pickling. Uh, this is our indoor garden. Our indoor garden, each hydroponic machine, grows 25 pounds of vegetables in 28 days. They use 95% less water and 98% less land. We currently have six, and, and we're hoping to have a total of 20. Now, our garden isn't meant to feed our community. Our garden is meant to educate our community on community economic development. So this machine, we have all the data for this machine. We know how much we're paying per kilowatt based on paying somebody $15 an hour. It's very profitable because you're cutting a lot of the energy costs and it's very efficient. What we're doing is we're uh, procuring a lot of uh, uh, partnerships with the community, local stores, uh, for, um, a, lot of the local, a lot of the local stores and restaurants. We're providing a lot of food for them and also a, a lot of uh, different um, community farms where we're sell, selling a lot of our produce. And not only are we selling uh, some of the produce, but we're also growing different plants, um, different plants, either house plants or outdoor plants. Some of these plants are very, very profitable. Uh, outside of these plants, we're also uh, focusing on growing thyme, basil, um, educating our community on a lot of the different herbs that cross the blood-brain barrier to extract a lot of the harsh metals for people that have been impacted through uh, lead and other toxins that uh, have made their way through. And the last and most important part is we gather our community to really help them understand the, the economic component to what we're doing. And that's educating them on a business plan. What would it look like if you had a small business on the side uh, in the area of gardening? And how could you work together? Just as a, a garden pollinates each other, how could we as a community pollinate each other? And one of the ways that we've done that is bring some experts from uh, Chicago Booth School of Business and also Kellogg School of Management, where some of the students are involved in helping uh, um, our clients come up with different business plans. And the product of that is our salsa. Uh, we have a salsa that's made out of a lot of different vegetables. And somebody's growing corn, somebody else is growing tomatoes, and we're helping the community work together so that ultimately they could create a product that's marketable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Of course, this is when we notice that there's no salsa here. So just throwing that out there. That looks really delicious. Uh, what would you say you grow the most of? Lettuce. Lettuce? OK. That's very cool. Um, that's awesome. And what was growing in the hydroponic machines? Do you recall? Uh, the different plants? Yeah. I'm not going to too okay. With that, okay. But. They looked. Good. I mean, they look nice and healthy. They look like happy plants. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, that brings us to Stacy Peterson. Uh, Stacy joined the National Center for Appropriate Technology in 2008. She oversees NCAT's Sustainable Energy Program, which includes the Agri Solar Clearinghouse Energy Efficiency Program, Energy Services, Low Income Home, Low Income Energy Assistance Program Clearinghouse, or LIHEAP Clearinghouse, National Energy Assistance Referral Program, and the Residential Energy Program. Uh, she develops interdisciplinary projects with diverse teams, such as connecting the NCAT Sustainable Energy and Agriculture programs and the AgriSolar Clearinghouse in her energy conservation work. She's helped save enough energy to go to the moon and back 25, more than 2,500 times, which could come in handy next year because apparently we're going back to the moon in 2024, which is pretty cool. I'm looking forward to that. So, Stacy, I'll invite you to the lectern. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this and for having us here to speak today. 
So first off, uh, what is agri-solar? This might be a new term for some folks, but it's pretty simple. It's just ag and solar co-located together. Uh, there are a lot of other different terms you might hear that are pretty close to the same thing. You'll hear agrivoltaics, which is agriculture and photovoltaics. Agrisolar is a little bit bigger tent. It includes concentrated solar. So concentrated solar can be used in dairies for preheating water, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can have uh, agrisolar within your farmland landscape. You can have it with solar co-located with a crop solar with grazing, solar with an apiary or beekeeping, solar and pollinator habitat, solar and processing, solar and dairies. Uh, you can also have aquaculture, which is kind of neat. They float the solar, and then you can have maybe tilapia, something like that underneath. So lots of different terms for this, lots of different ways um, that you can approach agrisolar, but it's a pretty good win-win for farms and for rural communities. With agrisolar, you can harvest the sun twice. You can harvest it with the solar panel, and then you can harvest it again with the crops and the forage, the honey and the habitat. And I'd like to invite anybody in the room here today. We have some of the honey out at the main table. It's solar-grown honey from Bear Honey. Um, please sample. It's delicious. Uh, if you do this well, if you use best practices, you can diversify your farm revenue. You can increase rural energy independence. And we have some partners down in Arizona, down at Biosphere, that are doing research. And they're showing the decrease in crop irrigation needs in heat-stressed areas and in drought-stressed areas. They're going up to half, sometimes three-quarters in areas like Arizona, in a decrease in water needs and crops. So this can be significant. You're also getting an increase in solar panels. Solar panels opt operate optimally at a, at a lower temperature. And when they get really hot, they're not operating as well. The crops and the forage underneath lower the temperature, and it helps the solar panels to operate at a better efficiency. With grazing as a vegetation management, you're saving money. Uh, you're not needing to go out there with weed whackers, mowers, more labor. You have grazing. Uh, you're going to increase your soil organic matter when you do that. You're going to increase your carbon accrual. You're going to increase the local ecosystem, habitat, and health. You can do this in a way that supports native species. And you can, we're seeing results from some folks up in Minnesota, some of our partners from Argonne National Lab are seeing results of a triple in the amount of pollinators of bees, bats, and butterflies to the ecosystem services. So this can have a really big impact to the entire ecosystem around the solar panels. There's a lot of federal programs that are supporting this, even though it's just a new practice. Um, there's a lot of good support out there. The Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technology Office, the CEDAW office, is who funds us to do our work in the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. Uh, they also have a program that's longstanding called the INSPIRE program, and that is run by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. They're also partners of ours, um, and they're doing some great work all around the country. They've got some wonderful demonstration sites on this. Uh, they've funded the farms projects that happened last year, and these are for megawatt scale to see how this scales up and to see how that works. USDA has funded quite a few of these through the Climate Smart Commodities. Uh, one of them we're a partner on with University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. They'll be installing 10 to 12 different agrisolar sites around the Rio Grande Valley. We'll be providing technical assistance, doing workshops on the ground help. Uh, University of Arizona, our partners down there, got one of the Climate Smart Commodities. Uh, they'll be doing further research around Arizona into, air, into agrisolar. And then we have other partners. Uh, Helical Solar uh, is working on one with low-carbon beef, and they've got this really interesting racking system that allows you to graze cattle. So it's a little bit taller, a little bit thicker to accommodate for the, for the cattle rubbing against the racking system. You can also use the REAP program for, for this to fund it. Um, and hopefully more soon, there's a marker bill right now in the ARA to define agrivoltaics and to provide mechanisms of support, and I believe that there will also be one um, in the farm bill. So as I mentioned, we manage the AgriSolar Clearinghouse at NCAT. We're a sustainable energy and a sustainable agriculture nonprofit. We've been doing this since about the 70s. So when I learned about this concept of bringing together ag and energy, I was really excited. Uh, that's exactly what our company does. So we wanted to work on that. We also do a lot of technical assistance. So we do programs like ATRA. We have, uh, that's technical assistance for farmers through USDA. We have programs like the LIHEAP Clearinghouse with Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and we do solar energy engineering and energy efficiency engineering. So this was just this perfect mechanism, I thought, for us to really be able to help. 
So we applied for funding with Department of Energy and we got it. And we started the AgriSolar Clearinghouse with about 40 different partners around the country. So it's a broad coalition of the national laboratories, universities, folks like the Smithsonian, um, people all over the country are, are working with us on this. This is a few features of the Clearinghouse, if you'd ever like to learn more about this. Uh, we have an information library that has over 600 different abstracted, peer-reviewed pieces of information, so it's easy for you to search, to look through it. We also create e original media. We have a short film series. We have a podcast serial. I think one just came out today. Uh, we have a financial assistance map, so if you want to do this in your state, you can look and see what's available in your state to help pay for it. Uh, we have case studies. We have an atlas of this. We um, also develop best practices. So I, that's always needed, especially in a young industry like this. Uh, we do individualized technical assistance. We talk on the phone to folks, Zoom with folks. In person is fine, but we seem to do most of this virtually, so we can do it all around the country. We provide educational webinars. We've been doing a webinar series the last six or seven months, and we'll continue that. We have a user forum, and then we also do these events. We go out around the country. We have a thing called the Follow the Sun Tour. So because this is so new, we want to bring people to these places, let them see them, let them talk to the farmers, let them talk to the policymakers, the people that did this, maybe the solar developer in that area. Uh, we have a lot of fun at these. We do farm-to-table events. Um, we bring the honey around, have everybody taste it. So these are a good time. Um, you can, it's open to anybody to come to. So if it's in your area, please come and, and see these great sites. These are some of our recent publications that we've pulled together. Uh, we have a few on policy. There is one on policy approaches. Talks a little bit about how you would want to approach a policy in your area. And we have one that provides a landscape of what's going on in policy around the country. We talk about that at a state level and at a county level. Uh, some of the states, uh, like Massachusetts, has a feed-in tariff. Uh, some states, like... Um, Michigan have like a mandate for pollinator habitat at solar. So it's all over the map and it gives a nice overview of what's out there. So if folks are wanting to develop their own policy, this is a place to go for you to start. We just put out a practical guide on agrisolar ownership. So if you're a farmer or a landowner or a community and you want to know what to do to get started, what I should be considering, we've got that out there now. We have webinars on all of these recorded and available on our website. Um, it'll really step you through, you know, do I want to lease? Do I want to own? What do I got to think about? What are my paybacks? Things like that. And we're always there for assistance if you need it. You can call us up. We'll help walk you through that. So in summary, uh, AgriSolar is a win-win on the ground. It can be a win on farms, and it can be a win for climate, energy, and the economy. Uh, I believe it can be a win-win in the farm bill, and we're here to help. I'd like to thank EESI for organizing this, and I'd like to thank DOE and the CEDAW office in particular for funding us to do this work. I'd like to thank the USDA and NCAT, and then our AgriSolar Clearinghouse team and partners and our community. Um, that's an email if you ever need to get a hold of us. Um, and then we also have a newsletter. It comes out bi-weekly. You can go to our homepage and sign up for that, or you can always just email us and we'll sign you up. Thanks. Thank you much for that. Thank you so much, um, Stacy. You mentioned REAP. Uh, REAP is one of the programs that we have one of those side-by-side-by-sides for. So as we get House and Senate text for REAP, we'll be, we'll be tracking the changes that are coming out of two different chambers with that. So just wanted to mention that plug. We're getting questions from our online audience, and we're also, uh, we also have an in-person audience. So after our final speaker today, we'll have a Q&A. If you're in our online audience and you have a question, you can follow us on social media at EESI online, hashtag EESI talk, and you can also send us an email, and the email address to use is ask at AS, uh, that's ASK at EESI.org. Kathleen Draper uh, is our, fourth, our fifth panelist today, and Kathleen has been a part of the biochar industry for over a decade. She's been the board chair of the International Bio, Biochar Initiative since 2019, and she sits on the U.S. Biochar Initiative. Most recently, Kathleen co-founded Sea Interest, a composites company in upstate New York, developing and deploying biochar-based composites for the building and packaging industries. Kathleen has co-authored two books on biochar and has written white papers and articles about the subject for more than a decade. Kathleen, thank you for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and good afternoon. It's always fun to be the last one. <laughs> 
Uh, so 10 minutes is not a lot of time to cover any topic, but I'm going to do my best to cover what biochar is. And in case any of you don't know what it is, I brought some samples that are over there. What biochar production is all about and how it can help farmers to both reduce their impact and adapt to climate change and to foster more resilient rural economies. I'll also talk about synergies between biochar production and use with other on-farm organic management practices, such as composting and anaerobic digestion. And I will also highlight some of the current and proposed federal support the industry is receiving, as well as other programs that could help farmers that move into biochar production. Over the decade that I've been in biochar, I've learned that there's many ways to answer the question, what is biochar? To those in the climate world, I say that it is the oldest carbon removal technology that most people have never heard of. To my mom and her ilk, I've taken to calling it burnt toast. It is over-baked organic material that results in something that is unappetizing to humans and soil mo microbes alike. And since it's unappetizing, it means that a good portion of the carbon dioxide that the plants absorbed during their lifetime and turned into carbon does not return to the atmosphere and get released as CO2, as it normally would if it's left to decay. If that charred material is put into soils or other long-lived products and not burned as charcoal would be, then the carbon cycle is effectively interrupted for hundreds or even thousands of years. Any type of organic material, from wood to crop residues to manure and even sewage sludge, can be turned into biochar, and in many cases, renewable energy as well. It uses high heat and low oxygen in a process known as pyrolysis. One of the unique things about biochar is that it is eminently scalable. You can make biochar when you're cooking the family meal. You can make it by digging a ditch in your backyard. You can utilize small-scale equipment on farms that generate both heat and biochar. You can utilize mobile systems and take it into forests to help reduce hazardous fuel loads, or you can make it with more industrial scale equipment that generates biochar and a number of other co-products. While much of the attention biochar is receiving these days has to do with, with its ability to sequester carbon, there are many other co-benefits co that can help farmers both economically and environmentally. Converting crop residues or manure into biochar can be cost-effective organics management. Over the past few years, we've seen the demand for biochar-based carbon removal credits rise dramatically. The current price for these biochar-specific credits is now between $100 and $200 per ton of CO2e. And when you convert that back into biochar, that can be more than $300 per ton. Combining biochar with other on-farm nutrient sources can turn that biochar into a slow-release fertilizer, which these days can generate significant savings for farmers. And combining biochar with manure composting can reduce methane emissions by up to 80%. So with the proper incentives, this source of methane could be dramatically reduced today. Biochar can also help farmers to adapt to a changing climate. By optimizing soil's ability to manage water, that includes both droughts and downpours. Building soil carbon reduces crop losses in bad weather, in addition to enhancing both yields and food security. And it can also be used to alleviate toxins in soils, leading to healthier food production. Just to drill down a bit more on one of the ways biochar can help reduce climate change beyond carbon sequestration, let's have a quick look at biochar and nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most limiting nutrient for crop productivity. Ever since its debut after World War II, it's been one of the key reasons for increasing crop productivity sufficiently to feed our growing human population. Unfortunately, there are a number of negative environmental impacts from the excessive use of nitrogen, not least of which is that nitrogen production and use contributes nearly 2% of global emissions. 
and currently it's taking up 3 to 5 percent of natural gas supplies to produce nitrogen fertilizers. Yet more than 50 percent of applied nitrogen is lost, either to the air through vaporization or leaching into soils below the root profile, so it's no longer doing it any good, and it can in fact lead to groundwater contamination. An excessive nitrogen fertilizer also creates acidic soils and favors nitrogen-loving plants, leading to biodiversity loss. Nitrogen runoff after rain events negatively impacts water bodies, where it leads to huge algal blooms, which causes even more emissions, and it leads to eutrophication and large-scale fish kill. Combining bi biochar with smaller amounts of nitrogen creates a slow-release fertilizer, which increases nitrogen use efficiency, resulting in savings to farmers and reduced emissions. It can also reduce leaching and runoff and increase soil pH, a real win-win-win for farmers. You may be surprised to learn that one of the largest buyers of biochar in the U.S. at the moment is the composting industry. While some in the composting world worried that biochar would be a competitor, in fact, it is very synergistic with composting operations on-farm or beyond. There's several reasons for that. Biochar holds on to nutrients longer, making the compost more valuable. It reduces the time needed to finish composting, making composting more efficient. It heats up the piles hotter, killing off more pathogens. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions, sometimes significantly, as I mentioned, with manure. It provides longer-lasting carbon, which makes it eligible for carbon removal credits. And it can even immobilize toxic metals, herbicides, and organic pollutants, making it safer for use on land that's used to grow Food. There are also a number of synergies between anaerobic digestion when it's co-located with pyrolysis, particularly if there's insufficient local, local demand for the digestate or the fiber that results from anaerobic digestion. This fiber can be dewatered and used as a feedstock for pyrolysis, resulting in rapid and significant volume reduction. A portion of the resulting biochar can be fed back into the digester where it provides a buffering capacity and it also inhibits the production of hydrogen sulfide. And this results in higher quality and quantity of methane produced, which is obviously an incentive for farmers to increase their revenue. The biochar can also be used to absorb some of the liquid effluent. And again, this will turn the biochar into a slow release fertilizer. While these benefits have mostly been seen in the lab, we're now starting to see them demonstrated commercially. And one of the first small demonstration plants is in my neck of the woods in upstate New York. It's being funded uh, at the state level through NYSERDA. It's being spearheaded by Cornell University, and it's being hosted at Spruce Haven Dairy Farm. We're starting to see some promising initiatives at the federal level, which supports biochar use by farmers. Uh, most recently, the National Resource Conservation Service passed what's called the Soil Carbon Amendment Protocol, or Code 336, used to be called Code 808, uh, which provides financial support to farmers to increase their soil carbon levels, either through putting compost, biochar, or a combination of the two on their fields. And we hope to see significant uh, funding in this in the Farm Bill. The U.S. Forest Service also received $100 million from the Infrastructure Bill and has used some of that to fund support of the U.S. Biochar Initiative's efforts to demonstrate how to use mobile equipment to thin forests and to help create demand for the resulting biochar. And this funding was matched by the U.S. Endowment of uh, for Forestry and Communities. Other programs which could provide support are the USDA BioPreferred and uh, uh, US made products as well as low embodied carbon preferences. 
Uh, to wrap up, if those of you, for those of you that would like to learn more about biochar, we're hosting the very first Biochar Academy in upstate New York in late June. Within that, there's a two-day opportunity for you to go visit the, uh, the pyrolysis on the dairy farm. And I would also encourage you to look at the websites for the International Biochar Initiative or the U.S. Biochar Initiative. We just hosted a webinar on Code 336 as well. And to wrap up, my, my mantra has usually been um, biochar, it's safe, scalable, and shovel ready, but Pastor Moy, you might appreciate my new mantra is, it's not a miracle, but it's holy. And not because it's divine, because if you look at it under a microscope, it's very porous. <laughs> so thank you very much. That was a great presentation, and um, I like charpe diem. Um, I like to do things like that, so game has to recognize game when it sees it. So that was, that's really good. Um, all right, so we have, uh, thanks to incredible time discipline on the part of our panelists, uh, we have a lot of time for Q&A, and I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and we also have uh, Joe Thompson, who's the Assistant Director for Natural Resources and Environment at GAO. He's going to come join us at the begin front of the room here in the front row as well, uh, and he can participate in the, in the Q&A as well. Um, but let's get started with the questions and answers. And um, my friend Isabella has a microphone. So if anyone has a question in the audience, she will make your way over uh, to you. Um, and to help get us started, to give us a little bit more time, I'm going to kick things off. And Mike, I'm going to start with you with this one. Um, I would like to um, sort of dig a little bit deeper on the employment opportunities that some of these agriculture climate solutions um, offer. And I'm curious, uh, sort of how would you characterize sort of how workers are benefiting today? Um, and are there transferability of skills opportunities between, uh, you know, e existing energy sector and agriculture sector opportunities? And um, curious what you what you found in your research about that topic. Well, I think that um, our perspective on it is probably a little bit different than than uh, the other panelists. But I would say that. Every time a producer um, improves their resilience, either by adopting a climate resilient practice or by uh, diversifying their operations or moving to uh, either a production methodology or to a crop that is going to be more resilient to climate change, that's a job saved. And every job that that producer supports, that's another job saved. So. Great. Um, and Audrey, curious what you think about uh, sort of economic development opportunities and employment opportunities across some of these different solution sectors. Yeah, sure. So with agroforestry, we obviously already have a whole industry of technical service providers working to help our farmers here in the U.S. adopt new conservation practices. There's an opportunity to help retool them so that they have a better understanding and more fluency, familiarity with agroforestry in particular. And so we have some key partners that are part of our grant, Virginia Tech, um, as well as University of um, Missouri's Center for Agroforestry. They're both doing really important work in terms of professional development for existing folks to become more comfortable with these new and emerging practices. Um, and Moy, what are you seeing in your neighborhood in terms of economic development opportunities and job creation opportunities in your community? Yeah, what I love seeing about what I love seeing the most is uh, seeing our community self uh, awareness and uh, self of uh, self agency continue to increase. Uh, that has paid a lot of dividends in itself, just because um, doing it via agriculture has helped them to move and scale that into different areas of community economic development. That's great. And Stacy. How are things looking in, in the um, sort of nexus of agri-solar and, and the work that you're doing? From a financial perspective? Employment opportunities. What are you looking, what are you seeing in terms of uh, economic development and job creation opportunities? Sure. Yeah, you know, this, this can really help diversify farm income, and, and, and it can also bring solar installation jobs into rural communities. Uh, you can, this can help diversify income, too, for, like, community gardens. This can be community solar. So there's a lot of different ways that this can be an economic win for a community or for an individual farmer. And there are some um, incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act for solar around 
production tax credit investment. Yes, there are. There Do you have any, uh, what, what effect could that have on the ability to bring community solar to more, more communities and things like I that? I think it's going to have a phenomenal effect. I, I think that you're going to see solar growth throughout the country at a rapid rate because of this. And I think that it's going to bring the payback down uh, to, to people, you know, much, much lower. And, it, you know, it can be more expensive to do agri-solar uh, if you want to raise your racking system, if you want to incorporate crops, you want to have more labor for crop yield. Uh, that was going to help that pencil out a little bit better. So I, I think it's really going to help this practice. And Kathleen, we'll give you the last question on sort of economic development employment opportunities and um, sort of what you're seeing for workers joining the biochar uh, industry. Well, I think I'll reframe it a little bit. One of the obstacles to growth for, say, dairy farms or even sawmills is organics management. They need to have enough land or they need to uh, increase their manure storage capacity. And what we're finding is that if you have a pyrolysis uh, unit on site, either on the farm or next to a sawmill, those, those barriers go, to wet, go away and it diverses, diversifies its revenue streams as well. So we're, we're seeing a lot of excitement uh, at the possibility of co-locating pyrolysis on farmer and forestry um, businesses. And we got an online question that I think, yeah, I think Kathleen, you're probably the right person to start with. And so uh, we'll st I'd like to start with you and then I'd like be interested in hear what the other panelists have to say. And the question is, will other stakeholders and players integrate biochar as well? For example, are there opportunities in agroforestry to incorporate biochar beyond what you included in your presentations? Oh, absolutely. I think because you're going to have to have some rigorous pruning throughout, you know, to, to grow the things that you want to grow properly. So that's a great biomass for, um, you know, creating biochar. And then you can use the biochar when you're planting these things. And a lot of research has shown that it in, gets them into production faster. It helps um, with, you know, immunity in trees and things like that. So there's, there's absolutely a lot of work going on between agroforestry and biochar. Sure. Yeah, it, I think that we were just talking about this before the presentation. I, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for this, uh, for the integration of biochar and agrisolar. I think that it could be a way for a site that is already just a bare ground solar installation to become an agrisolar installation. And I think that farms could incorporate this as well as they're installing their solar. So I'd love to see this happen. And Moy and Audrey and Micah, thoughts from you all about sort of opportunities to um, uh, work together with the biochar industry? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of conversations and interest in the agroforestry industry around the opportunities with biochar. It's, um, you know, I think it's whenever you're working in these regenerative systems, if there's complementary opportunities to use inputs that are more regenerative as well, that's an interesting opportunity to explore. And I don't want to over biochar the conversation, but since you brought props, uh, as folks are leaving the room today, could you tell us a little bit about what they're going to be seeing in, in your your your? So the in the box, I have samples of biochar made from everything from recycled cardboard to bones to uh, uh, cherry pits. So if you pick them up, uh, you'll see what they were made from, although it's kind of dirty at this stage. Then I also brought some samples of different composites that you can make biochar um, using biochar. So some of it is, is uh, drywall and insulation. And I failed to bring the, the most interesting one for this crowd, which is um, a sort of agricultural mulch that they're experimenting with, where the binder can be degraded at the end of the growing season and the biochar can be tilled into the ground to get some of the plastics out of agriculture. Well, you didn't say where the bones came from, so we'll let that go. <laughs> um, I don't know, but there are, there are like femur shit. No, I'm just teasing. Um, so the, you all described sort of the, the opportunity uh, sort of at present, um, but let's make this briefing a little bit more forward looking. If, if, um, if there are steps forward taken in the, in the upcoming farm bill um, along the lines of what you would like to see, uh, what does that mean for, Audrey, maybe we'll start with you. What does that mean for agroforestry? What does sort of success look like over the course of the next five years or so if um, the if the farm bill is supportive in a way that you would like it to be for, for agroforestry. And then really interested in hearing what the other panelists have to say too. Yeah, I'd say for me, the ultimate success that I'm excited to look for, and I hope it's in five years, it might be a few more than that, but it's to be at the grocery store and see products that say, this is a livestock product, you name it, eggs, 
you know, chicken, whatever, and that it's grown in a silvopasture setting. How exciting would that be? That's not an opportunity that we have today as climate conscious consumers to choose silvopasture products or say a box of cereal that proudly says this was grown in an alley cropping system. Someday that would be extremely exciting to see. Another piece of success, though it's not exactly farm bill, but federal policy is working on insurance products that are crop insurance products that are specific for some of these agroforestry crops that today aren't properly captured. Um, and so that's something that we're also working on. Moy, I'll go to you next. Sure, the success would be reflective on a community, seeing a healthier community because of a lot of the um, practices that, were, that will be put in place that, that, would, um, that would be great to see. Great. Um, and Stacy, after Kathleen. Sure. I think success would look like seeing this as a best practice, as a standard practice in solar installation around the country. And I would like to see, you know, through the Farm Bill, there be a way for this to be affordable for farmers to do and for them to have a good way to understand how to do it, have practical information out there, have technical assistance that helps them do it and see them do more research, see what this does to the soil health, what does this do to soil um, water carrying capacity, things like that. So I'd, I'd like to see more research, more implementation, and more best practices. Kathleen? Kathleen? I think success looks like incentivizing resilient practices um, and also getting more education out there that, from trusted sources. And speaking of trusted sources, we have GAO here, so we'll turn to you next, Micah. And Joe, please feel free to chime in too if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I would say is what we would like to see, you know, if Congress decides that they want to pursue additional resilience actions is, is make progress with the recommendation and on some of the options that we identified to make producers more resilient. You know, if we move in that direction, there's some planning and there's some implementation, then I think that would be what we're looking for right now. So. Yeah, I would just add that, uh, I mean, GAO basically produced a roadmap for how to build climate resilience into everything that USDA does, many of those farm bill programs. So progress over time is uptake of those options in this farm bill and other farm bills to the extent that, uh, that Congress chooses to address climate resilience in the farm bill itself. So there's a roadmap there. We can measure the progress over time, and GAO is set up to do that with our disaster resilience framework. And so GAO, um Micah, in Micah's presentation, you talked about the report that you just produced, but for the congressional staff in the audience today and our online audience, um, and for people who watch the live cast later on, are there any um, new reports or new uh, key sources of information, any new developments that congressional staff should be on the lookout for in the next year or so, whether it's out of GAO or, or, or another agency that you might be uh, sort of tracking that we would want to, folks to know about? Well, I mean, obviously, we just produced uh, the high-risk list update, which just came out in April. Um, Joe was involved with that. And then uh, the report that, that I wrote, which came out in January. We're going to also, uh, obviously, have oversight activities associated with the IRA. Um, and then uh, I think that we have, Joe can speak to this a little bit more, but we have some work that's going to be looking more closely at uh, car carbon offsets and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So. Yeah, we have work underway all across the federal government looking at climate resilience and, and also various sustainability efforts. So if you have any questions about any of that, we're here to help. I think we have you know 10 or 11 jobs underway right now looking at different programs. Uh, in the agriculture area, as Micah said, we have some ongoing work uh, looking at pests and diseases. And uh, we will continue to do oversight, as Micah mentioned, of the IRA. Uh, but I, I think you should also pay attention to um, what USDA puts out in its continued climate change adaptation progress reports, because they should be able to uh, provide some specific information about how they will or will not move forward on the options that we laid out in our report on climate resilient agriculture. So that might be of interest to you. Any other things coming out in the next year or so from other panelists that you'd like to kind of put on people's radar screens? Feel free to to speak up if there are any. All right. Uh, well, we'll keep track of it too at ESI and keep putting uh, articles and things like that out. Um, Moy, I think I'd like to start with you with this next question and um, uh, sort of the idea of education was a big part of your presentation and a big part of what you're you're doing out in Chicago. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about 
sort of how we can attract the next generation of farmers into the agriculture sector and sort of capture the imaginations of people who are thinking about sort of what to do with their careers. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, um, you know, generating interest in, in, in the garden work that you do, but then also maybe the tech and the automotive sector? But how, how are you bringing in that next generation? What are you finding is working? Yeah, we're doing it through cu curiosity. We're helping them be curious about imagining a different future of what it would look like for them to be a potential farmer using a lot of the regenerative methods in agriculture or being a skilled mechanic. Um, what I love about the 3D printing components of what we're doing is that uh, we have a uh, engineer by trade who does the work of a patent attorney and our whole tagline within the 3D printing department is we want to help stir up your creativity and imagination problem solving skills. So anything that they could think of, we could try to help them produce. And what it does is it stirs up an ima our imagination, which, which I think in our day it's underutilized, but being able to draw the next generation in via their imagination, via their curiosity, I think is going to be our, our, our best uh, window of opportunity. Stacy and Kathleen and Audrey, any additional thoughts about how we bring the next generation of people into, into farming and, and agriculture producing uh, uh, companies and things? Sure. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of really good programs out there like 4-H and Young Farmers of America, but I, I think with things like AgriSolar, people get excited coming from the energy side and coming from sustainability. And so I, I think there's a whole group of young people that are very interested in sustainability and green issues, and they're going to be interested in coming into agriculture because of that and into approaching sustainable agriculture and AgriSolar. So I think if you can show them stacked benefits, if you can, you know, they might not want to call it that, but um, if you can show them this additional benefit and, and show them what they could be doing and help imagine, as you say, uh, this greener world in, in a better way. I, I think you're going to get people inspired, and I think they're going to want to join. Great. Kathleen, any additional thoughts? Well, I grew up on a farm, and I moved back there uh, a while ago. And interestingly, it's, it's not a challenge to find young people involved in um, agriculture these days, especially the Mennonite community. I mean, they're <laughs> prolific in my area. But I think one of the key barriers is affordability. You know, land's expensive. The equipment's expensive. We need to figure out a way to make it, you know, not as risky. Yeah, I mean, we've we've had great examples where there was a, you know, speaking to the question of affordability of land access, that's a really key one when we're thinking about new farmers that want to get into perennial agriculture. A leasing options maybe not going to be the right fit given the long-term nature of these perennial crops. So there's some really great stories that have come out where, for example, there's a grazing family, they have a bunch of children, and one of their children has decided to stay on the farm and develop their own fruit and nut operation, literally stacking, if you will, a 3D operation, a new operation onto the existing family's farm, which is a really exciting story for the continuity of how that family can keep their land for the long term. We're also in a time of historic land transfer. A lot of folks where, you know, uh, you know, say the grandfather passed away and the children have gone and moved to the city for urban jobs and they have this land and they maybe have an ethos that they want to do things differently, not just rent it to the neighbor to hay it. How could they do something more regenerative? And then that's when they come to us asking, what does agroforestry look like? So that's another key place right now where that next generation is coming in. Yeah, that was a big subject of our organics briefing we did back in March uh, about uh, bringing, you know, providing opportunities for people who want to get into farming to actually be able to get into farming. It was really interesting. Um, Micah or Joe, any thoughts about sort of next generation? Um, oh, we have a question in the audience. So Isabella, please wait for the mic so that our uh, live cast can pick it up. But go ahead. Thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Amy McCray Kessler. I'm actually a founder, co founder of the US Biochar um, Coalition, which is a new organization to um, advocate for biochar to do um, a lot of what um, Micah and um, his colleague are talking about in terms of risk mitigation. And I just wanted um, to, to ask I mean, all of the topics that everyone's talked about today are critical to our future going forward. Um, we all know that they need to happen and there are so many people working to make them happen. In our current political setting, um, one of the things that the uh, uh, Biochar Coalition is doing is figuring out how do we talk to politicians about that so it crosses um, all political uh, arenas. And I think um, what the uh, GAO 
office has really picked up on is um, fiscal responsibility. I think that is is the key and almost taking the climate um, part of it out um, and so that we talk about fiscal responsibility. And I just wanted to think of, uh, hear from the folks on the panel, have you started to reframe those conversations that way and instead of maybe the climate um, uh, resilience framework or disaster resilience framework, it's more about fiscal responsibility. Anyone's welcome to, to chime in if you'd like. Uh, go, uh, of course, the biochar <laughs> person has something to say about biochar, but go ahead, Kathleen. Well, having grown up in a very conservative area, mostly farming community, I hardly ever talk about climate change when I talk about biochar. Um, I talk about soil health and resilience and you know, yield improvement and toxicity um, mobilization and stuff like that. As soon as I start with climate change, the conversation's over. Um, so reframing is really important. Knowing what your audience concerns are is really important. I completely agree. That's we go with the resilience framework a lot. We talk about you know what kind of water savings do you have, what kind of energy savings can you have, what kind of assistance can you get, how can you get your costs down, how can you keep your farm, what kind of payback do you have. So we really stay with the fiscal. Um, Moyer, Audrey, or Micah, or Joe, any additional comments on sort of the the reframing to get you know people interested from different perspectives. Well, I mean, it's, it's not reframing for GAO. That's what we do, right? We're classically accountants. So the whole reason that GAO is involved in the climate change issue is the, you know, the fact that the load of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will continue changing the climate regardless of what happens on emissions reductions. And we as a federal government need to be prepared for that. So every federal program will be affected. We need to manage that risk in the federal programs to save taxpayers money. That is the natural fit for GAO, and that's really why we're talking about climate change at all. And we do say climate change. So, so Joe, before you, just so that the live cast picks up, the follow-up question was about sort of how does um, how does that work uh, appeal to people across the political spectrum, people who might be less inclined to go along with the conversation if it is oriented around climate change? Yeah, I would say that it's important that we as GAO sort of stay in our lane. So as Micah mentioned, um, you know, emissions reductions discussions are separate from climate resilience discussions. And we recognize that the emissions reductions questions are primarily policy choices. But no matter what happens there, you need to be prepared for the changes that we're already seeing in federal programs, in flood insurance, crop insurance, disaster assistance. Uh, we need to do a better job with strategic planning. We need to do a better job providing people information so they can make risk management decisions for themselves. These are all things that everybody can get on board with because no matter your political party, you're actually seeing the impacts on the ground and your constituents are actually having to deal with these impacts on the ground. And, and we can help. Uh, build that risk management into federal programs of all types, be it Department of Defense, agriculture, anything that the federal government does, we're looking at it trying to figure out how to manage that risk for taxpayers. Yes, thanks, Joe. Um, so I think our, I'd like to um, ask this, this next question, and Kathleen, maybe we'll start with you again and we'll move down the row, but we talked a lot about win-wins. Um, I think we probably should have called the briefing climate, energy, environment, win, 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 wins, because I think it goes beyond the, just the two wins. But are there other win wins that we haven't talked about today um, that you would like to raise awareness of? Or are there um, sort of synergies between biochar and other topics that we've talked about today that we haven't, um, haven't yet brought to, brought to the front? One of the things that's coming up a lot recently is the whole issue of PFAS in in soils and water and everything. So what's been interesting, I just hosted a webinar on this a few months ago, is that uh, these forever chemicals can actually be degraded in the pyrolysis process, and it can be used to immobilize them in soils, which is really critical because there are certain farmers in Maine and elsewhere that can't use their soils to grow crops anymore because it's it's toxic. And so I think I think we're going to see a lot more research in that area, proving that it can work in in various scenarios. Stacy, 
Sure. One thing I've been interested in lately is following solar as water conservation. There is, uh, particularly in California and in the, the desert southwest, they're building canals and they're covering them with solar and they're using that as a way to, to save water. And, and you can do the floating solar, like, like the aquaculture, but they're also doing it expressly for water conservation. And I, I think you'll see more of that, and I, I find it really fascinating. So I'm excited to watch what develops, especially in California. Yeah, I remember the first time I visited Phoenix, I was like, wait, they just leave the water exposed? Like, it is the desert. The sun's right there. Like, <laughs> apparently it worked for a while, but glad to see that people are thinking about that. Um, Moy, other comments you want to make sure that we get talked about today? One of the books that's really influenced me is uh, Nature Fix, and it talks a little bit about how uh, the win for our community is reflected on how they become healthier, happier, and more creative by just integrating a lot of these different practices uh, within agriculture and, and what they're doing. So uh, create, creating healthier communities that are not only eating healthier, but also out in nature is definitely a win, especially if it becomes a win-win mm -hmm. Uh, to the to the fourth exponent. So. Yeah. And the way you the way you tell that story, uh, the way in your presentation, and other like that that in itself is a win, right? It's a success story of the of the community. In in addition, you know, sort of beyond of what your what your organization is able to do. Audrey. Yeah, I'd say with silvopasture in particular, it lends itself really well to be complemented with rotational grazing and other good managed grazing techniques. They go really well together, so highly recommend those going side by side. And then there's also, of course, other edge of field practices that should be used, things like wetlands, uh, two-stage ditches, prairie strips. So those kind of practices can also be used when you're um, implementing new agroforestry practices. And Micah, I think we'll give you the last word today. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I, I think that from our perspective, you look at the agricultural sector and every time that we build resilience into that sector and we have experience and we do that planning, then there's going to be transferability to other sectors. And, and hopefully, you know, if we get enough economic sectors bought into this and mainstreaming climate resilience, it'll have a cascading effect, you know, throughout the entire system. So... Well, this was a really interesting discussion. I would like to say sincerest thanks to our panelists, Micah, Audrey, Moy, Stacy, and Kathleen. Thank you for joining us today to talk about these really, really cool multiple win agriculture sector climate solutions. Thank you so much. I'd also like to say thanks again to Senator Stabenow uh, and her staff for helping us have the room today. We really, really appreciate that. Um, in addition to my ESI colleagues, who I'll get to in just a moment, but we also got a lot of help um, from folks sort of in our in our orbit at ESI, um, I'd like to just shout out very quickly Matthew, Shana, uh, Ashana, and and Maureen for helping us think through sort of which solutions we would feature in our briefings today. Thank you so much. Um, we have a great set of colleagues at ESI. I'd like to say thanks to Dan O, or Dan O'Brien, uh, Omri, Allison, Anna, and Molly, as well as our great interns uh, Lindley, Isabella, and Madeline for all the hard work that went into today's briefing as well like to say a uh, big thanks to Troy, our videographer, for helping uh, get uh, our, our live stream out to lots and lots and lots of people today. We have a lot of briefings coming up. Um, some would say too many briefings. Dan O would say too many briefings, but, well, I, well no, it's not too many briefings. It's just the right amount of briefings. Uh, we'll be back two weeks uh, to do rural development, and that is going to be a really great briefing. I encourage everyone to check that one out. And then after that, we'll do um, Future of Forestry in the Farm Bill. That's June 7th. Uh, and then also on June 21st, we'll be back for our, the fifth of our series, Conservation Practices from Farms to Forests and Wetlands. On June 1st, we're going to be doing a briefing about hydrogen uh, with our friends at Environmental Defense Fund. I think that briefing has been posted. Uh, so you can go on uh, www.eesi.org uh, and sign up for that. Um, and then on uh, Tuesday, July 18th, uh, we'll be back in this room, Heart 902, uh, for the 2023 Congressional Clean Energy Expo. Um, that's something that we work uh, very closely with our friends at the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. That's co-chaired by Senator Jack Reed and Senator Mike Crapo. So that's going to be a really great event. We'll have a six-panel policy forum. We'll have an exhibition. And then we'll also have a reception. So that'll be a really fun day um, and uh, lots of great stuff uh, discussed there. Um, 
This last slide is a link. Uh, it has a link to our survey. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who takes two minutes to fill out the survey. We read every response. Uh, it really helps us think through things. If you're in our online audience, if you had an AV problem or audio problem or a visual problem, if the live cast was slow to start, if you have ideas for new topics, for folks in the room today, have any suggestions as well, if you have two minutes and you would be, wouldn't mind filling out the survey, uh, it really does help us get a lot better. And we'll go ahead and end there. Thanks again to our great panel, and thanks to everyone at ESI who pulled off the uh, briefing today. We'll be back two weeks for rural development, and until then, I hope everyone has, I hope everyone enjoys the amazing Wednesday weather uh, here in Washington. So thanks so much.